The high school is the particular pride of the citizens of Tacoma. When one considers the charm of the location, the size of the grounds, and the beauty of the building, it can be said without dispute that it is the finest high school in the United States. A. H. Yoder, City Superintendent of Schools, 1908. Written nearly 100 years ago, this description of Stadium High School still rings true today for many proud generations of past graduates as well as current students. Indeed, civic pride for Tacoma's venerable Brown Castle, its affectionate nickname, runs very deep in the community, even among those who never walked its halls to class or possess one of its diplomas. Educating some 39,000 graduates over the past 100 years, the castle has also served as an architectural icon over the past century, in much the same way that Mount Rainier has served Tacoma as nature's backdrop. The completion of the extensive two-year restoration and renovation of Stadium High School, culminating in the centennial celebration of 2006, provides a fitting occasion to look back in memory at this beloved architectural citizen, as well as to look forward in anticipation. In the words of Stadium's own motto, the castle, building on tradition, reaching for the future. The story of Tacoma's first high school begins, as does so much of our city's early history, with the arrival of the Northern Pacific Railway Company. Tacoma's origin dates to the late 1860s, when Job Carr established Tacoma City, a small hamlet of settlers near today's Old Town at the foot of North 30th Street. 
these early settlers hoped that their city would become the Puget Sound terminus of the Northern Pacific Rails. The railway did ultimately choose Tacoma over Seattle in 1873, but favored creation of a different town site along the waterway called New Tacoma, the area that would later develop into today's downtown. The two fledgling communities, separated by only a few miles along the Commencement Bay shoreline, prospered with the economic boom that followed, and eventually united in 1884 as the City of Tacoma, which brought the official population of the new city to 4,000. In the decade following the NP's choice of Tacoma as its western terminus, promoters and developers with interest in lumber and land development arrived to boost and share in Tacoma's prosperity. To mark the young city's rising fortunes, the Northern Pacific and Tacoma Land Company, the railway's land development subsidiary, commissioned the construction of a grand hotel overlooking the water on A Street, the site occupied today by the headquarters of the Frank Russell Company. Called simply the Tacoma, the hotel opened to great fanfare in 1884. With its attractive amenities for the discerning resident and traveler, the hotel signaled Tacoma's arrival as a rapidly growing metropolis of means. There would be people who would come by train and there would be the wagon or the limousine from the hotel waiting there to pick them up to take them to the hotel. And it started off as one small building, then it was added upon, and then across the street was another building that they added on for, for extra rooms. It was the social center of, of the city. The Tacoma Hotel was soon sold to private investors, but with the boom times of the 1880s attracting immigrants to Tacoma at the rate of nearly 1,000 per month, the Tacoma Land Company saw another opportunity and announced plans in early 1890 for construction of another grand hotel. According to the 1890 census, the city's population had now grown to 36,000, and with pleasure seekers from the east passing through on their way to Alaska, there were insufficient accommodations in the city. The site selected in May 1890 by the Tacoma Land Company and the Philadelphia architectural firm of Hewitt and Hewitt was a bluff with a waterfront view that rivaled and perhaps even surpassed that of the Tacoma hotels. Well, the site was selected uh, primarily for its prominence. I mean, it overlooks the bay, has beautiful views of Mount Rainier and the Olympics. Uh, it was originally called Pleasant Point. I mean, it was a picnic area. And it had a house on it at the time uh, that was built by a gentleman by the name of Blackwell who owned the uh, hotel down the dock where the train station emptied out at that time. Uh, why they picked it, it's, it's sort of a curiosity. They paid a lot of money for it, but it, I mean, really it came down to the prominence, I think, because the Tacoma Land Company owned a lot of property around town, but they didn't own that piece, and they actually bought that piece from the owners. From this location, high above the water, the scenery spanned from the Olympic Mountains in the west around to Vashon Island and east to Mount Tahoma. The nine-acre site comprised of the bluff and the adjacent ravine was purchased for $86,000. By autumn 1890, the Tacoma Land Company announced plans to build a great caravansary for $750,000 on the bluff and to develop the old woman's gulch portion of the property into a rustic park with arbors, seating, and walkways. The hotel would be called the Olympian and was to be constructed of stone, brick, and terracotta in a chateau or castle style. It would stand four to six stories in height, depending on the terrain, and would house some 250 rooms plus basements and attics. This sort of thought of as picturesque architecture it comes really uh, as a refined later period of the Queen Anne Victorian style. Um, borrowed from medieval and ancient idioms and ideas that came out of Europe mostly. And it really, they really did pump it up. Overblown, much more vertical than the original, you know, 14th, 15th century uh, style. Very identifiable if you know what you're looking at as, as a um, period piece. And, and that style was favored for hotels um, primarily hotels, but big um, uh, central civic buildings. Some city halls were built in that style, in the chateau-esque style. Well, the hotel originally was designed to have 250 rooms, and about a third of them actually had bathrooms. 
connected with them, which was a big deal in Tacoma at the time. It was in the newspapers that you know, 60, I think it was 68 rooms were gonna actually have their own private bathrooms. They didn't have to share one down the hall. So it was a very modern hotel. The lower level was going to be the billiard, billiard room, smoking room for the gentleman. There was a barber shop going in downstairs. Uh, the first floor was a series of reading rooms and dining rooms. The dining rooms overlooked the bowl. Uh, what is now the little wing that sticks out on the, the bowl side, there's a little two-story wing. That was the kitchen, below it was the bakery, below that was the boiler room where the boiler room is right now. And then the second through the fifth floors was all uh, guest rooms. You know, double, there's a quarter down the middle and both sides would have had rooms on it. And then up into the roof section was the servants or the, the workers, employees, staff rooms were all up in the attic. The last remaining watercolor illustration of the architect's vision for the tourist hotel from this period, framed and somewhat ambered by time, now hangs in the Stadium High School office. The Tacoma Land Company lost no time engaging permits, materials, and contractors, and construction was soon underway. Well, the, the bricks for the building, the materials for the building, came uh, from California from the Gladding McBean plant and, uh, just outside of San Francisco. They still make terracotta. And the brick and the terracotta both came from that same source. It's funny that they, there's actually a plaque on the building that says the, chi the, the brick came from China, which is incorrect. Uh, but the brick itself is a Roman bond brick. It's a, it's a short brick that's very long. So it's only two inches tall and it's about 12 inches long. And then it's uh, set in mortar that's only about an eighth of an inch thick. So when you look at it, it looks very monolithic. The whole brick veneer, does not you don't see the little mortar joints as much. And it's unusual, you don't see Roman brick at that time, and you don't see it in Tacoma except for two other buildings, and they also were supplied by the same company, and that's the Old City Hall and the Russell Joy Building, which is down on the University of Washington campus, where both bricks brought up in the 1890s. Which, interesting about that brick, and if, if you look closely, you'll see that one wing is darker than the other. One is more brown and one is more yellow. Originally, the architect intended to have the building go from dark to light. The lower floors are gonna be darker, and as it raised up, it would become lighter. It was a technique to make the building look uh, taller, you know, slender. It's something they used in the deco period, actually, 30 years later. But when the brick arrived, it appears that the craftsman just sort of took the closest pile to them and started in one wing rather than building bottom up. And so one wing ended up being much darker than the other. But no sooner had building began, the red-hot Tacoma economy began to cool. Through 1891 and 1892, funding became an issue and construction began to slow. Few, if any, could see the storm on the horizon. The Panic of 1893 swept across the nation quickly, destroying public financial confidence and ruining banks and businesses across the country, particularly those dependent upon the railroads. It put an end to the speculative boom times in Tacoma. The Northern Pacific Railway Company and the Tacoma Land Company went into receivership and work on the unfinished Olympian Hotel sputtered to a halt. It really crippled us. Uh, the railroad again was close to bankruptcy and, um, and Tacoma really went into, you know, an abrupt end to its kind of childhood period. Um, and the building's walls were partially up and the project just came to an abrupt halt and there it stood, um, 1893, um, stood there a big empty silhouette. With some floors still incomplete and others only partially roofed, the final work crews moved remaining construction materials inside for storage on temporary wooden floors, boarded the window and doorway openings, and locked up what was essentially only an exterior shell. Completion of the hotel would have to wait for the return of better days. However, a pivotal event would ensure that the destiny of the Olympian Hotel would not be the accommodation of private, well-heeled hotel guests, but rather the education of public high school students from all walks of life. For five years, the structure sat unfinished on the bluff. Then, on October 11, 1898, a spectacular fire of uncertain but suspicious origin gutted the interior of the shuttered hotel. The fire was so large it drew the attention of thousands who gathered on the surrounding seats to watch the spectacular blaze. 
The fire was so hot and, and, and so bright, it was a nighttime fire. It started at seven o'clock at night on October 11th, 1898. It was so bright that the cities of Seattle and Olympia uh, telegraphed the local newspaper asking if Tacoma was on fire. And it was so hot that it actually glazed the inside brick walls. So the bricks that were exposed during part of the construction, some of the pre-construction work, actually have drip marks in them where the brick has melted and is dripping down and then it cooled and made this glassy finish. So it's black and shiny and with little drips. So it was a very hot fire. What I always liked about it was the, uh, the, the fact that the fire started, and this was in the newspaper, the fire started in a pile of 80,000 wet cedar shingles. How does wet cedar shingles burn? But once it got going, it really burned. The promising edifice that once crowned the bluff now appeared to be a ruin. And there it remained for another five years, slowly deteriorating. In 1902 and 03, the Northern Pacific began to dismantle the structure for the face brick and other salvageable building materials. Some of this brick found its way into the construction of the Northern Pacific depots in Wallace, Idaho and Missoula, Montana. Watching the slow dismantling of the structure galvanized the people into action. As noted local historian Murray Morgan put it, Tacoma was small enough so that nearly everybody knew everybody. And in this case, the everybodies were civically engaged citizens in banking and business, several of whom had served on the Board of Education and knew firsthand of the pressing need for a separate building to house Tacoma's high school students. With the rapid escalation in Tacoma's population through the 1880s and early 1890s, the Young School District first began to offer high school instruction in the late 1880s for fewer than 24 students of high school age. Classes were conducted in a series of temporary quarters shared with younger students. In the fall of 1889, high school students were bounced from rooms in the original Central School located at South 11th and G Streets, today the site of Bates Technical College to more temporary space in Emerson School on St. Helens Avenue, located between South 2nd and South 4th Streets. Now numbering some 175 students, the program was moved again in search of space, this time to Bryant School at 814 South Ainsworth. Here, the larger rooms could accommodate the high school program for several more years, which had shot up to more than 330 students by mid-decade. By 1898, they were once again out of space and the Tacoma High School moved again. Now housed at the old Washington College building at South 8th and Tacoma Avenue, the site of today's Tacoma School District Central Administration Building, it had become painfully obvious that Tacoma High School needed a home of its own. Talk around town now turned to the idea of the Board of Education somehow acquiring the abandoned hotel structure and its surrounding property. So when Frederick Heath, the architect for Tacoma Public Schools, reviewed and backed a proposal of turning the ruined hotel into a school building, the 1903 School Board of Education promptly bought the land and what remained of the hotel from the Northern Pacific for the sum of $35,000. Despite squabbles over the vote on a bond issue to raise necessary funds and a lawsuit by a faction who considered the proposal untenable, the Board of Education eventually selected Heath as architect in charge. Wasting no time, by 1904 work was underway to convert the remnants of the Olympian Hotel into Tacoma's magnificent new high school building. In just under two years, the transformation from aspiring hotel to inspiring school was nearly complete. So eager officials were to use the new facility, the June commencement exercises for the Tacoma High School class of 1906 were held in the auditorium, weeks before the school officially opened the doors to its first enrolled pupils on the morning of September 10, 1906. Local newspapers gushed about the aesthetic accomplishments of the high school, its classrooms, recreational and instructional features. To the Board of Education belongs much praise for their liberality in the finishing of the building. The school's architect, Frederick Heath, had accomplished his mission for close to his projected bid of $200,000.
professional architects of today who assess the historical structure in preparation for the 2004 to 2006 Centennial Restoration Project found that the final design for the school was very much in keeping with the spirit of the original hotel design on the exterior, while the interior was almost entirely reconfigured to accommodate the needs of a high school in 1906. As a hotel, it had a lot of small windows. I mean, most hotels at that time had a lot of little windows because there was a lot of individual rooms. And for a school, you need large banks of windows. So they had to restructure a lot of the windows on the upper floors. A lot of people don't understand that those are not the windows that were there for the hotel. They restructured them to, to meet the needs of the high school. Uh, they also, for some reason, the hotel, when it was designed, had a, a varying floor-to-floor -floor height. And that wasn't consistent with the high school design either for the school design. So they actually moved some of the floors up and some of them down to get a consistent you know, 12 feet to floor to floor kind of thing going on in the building. And so that's why when you walk in the building, the sill heights, some vary from fairly low to fairly tall in the building is because they removed, you know, moved the floor system around. The building itself though, since it was supposed to be two stories taller, those walls are very stout. I mean, they're six feet thick at the lower, lowest level. And at the top, some of them are narrowing only down to 20 inches, which in a, that another masonry building of that time, if you had a five-story building, you'd be down to eight or 12 inches at the top. So they were very stout walls. Uh, so that helped a lot. It's helped us when we were doing the renovation process. There was a lot less seismic work needing to be done to some of those walls because of their thickness. Stadium is known as one of Frederick Heath's most notable achievements in a long and distinguished architectural career in Tacoma. Many of the schools, churches, homes, and public buildings he designed still grace this community. Tacoma was delighted with its impressive new educational institution, and the Brown Castle quickly became a local icon. However, Frederick Heath was not quite finished. Even before the high school was completed, newspapers in January 1906 reported his vision for the remainder of the acreage purchased by the Board of Education. For an additional $20,000, Heath suggested converting the neighboring ravine, which had been planned as a rustic park for hotel guests, into an athletic playing field for students. But why stop there, ran Heath's reasoning. Heath noted that the ravine actually formed a natural amphitheater and then appealed to Tacoma's ego by stating, there are Eastern colleges that would give $1 million for such an opportunity. This then was the origin of Stadium Bowl, which was to become far more to Tacoma than just an athletic field adjacent to a high school. In the decades long before such venues such as Cheney Stadium, the Tacoma Dome, or Ruston Way Waterfront, Stadium Bowl served as Tacoma's first large civic arena where tens of thousands could gather for sports, music, political speakers, fireworks, and other events. It also became the source of Stadium High School's name. What had been known simply as the Tacoma High School when the Brown Castle first opened in 1906, officially became Stadium High School in 1913 when a second institution, Lincoln Park High School, also designed by Frederick Heath, opened in the South End, requiring Tacomans to distinguish between the two. At the time of Heath's first proposal of the amphitheater or stadium idea, the ravine was known as Old Woman's Gulch for the number of widows of fishermen and longshoremen who lived as squatters in shacks along its slopes. Once the Board of Education granted its approval to the creation of an athletic field, these unfortunate women, by Heath's own unsentimental account, were displaced from their homes by the streams of dirt and water coming through the back windows as crews began to log the trees and use water hoses to sluice the dirt from the slopes to create a level floor in the ravine. But the additional construction of a poured reinforced concrete stadium surrounding the athletic field was a far more complex project. With a goal to seat 25,000 in the stadium, private citizens and businesses, students, public funds, and a subscription drive all contributed funds with $100,000 as the target for the stadium's financing. Uh, when, they, when they designed the stadium in the first place, it had actually had Roman arches going along the, the water side, sort of like the uh, Coliseum in California now, you know, the Rose Bowl, if you think of that. And there was a road that was like a bridge that was outboard of that, so you'd build a drive by the base of the, the dome on this little bridge. 
And it was a very beautiful structure. The problem is it was about twice the budget of what they could afford when it got bid. And it almost killed the project, but then the contractor, the architect, the engineer, came up with a way of cutting the budget in half. The stadium project began in early spring of 1909 and continued into 1910. Complex engineering was needed in the excavation and construction of foundations, retaining walls, and the massive tiered concrete seating. On June 10th and 11th, 1910, it seemed that all of Tacoma turned out for the grand civic dedication, which featured obligatory speeches, of course, but also some 7,000 Tacoma students from schools all across the city taking part in music, dancing, calisthenics, and track and field events. Later that same summer, the most northwestern parcel of land from the original hotel property was sold to the Ferry Museum and the Washington State Historical Society. The much needed proceeds from this land sale helped the Board of Education to pay off the construction of Stadium Bowl. In the following decades, Stadium Bowl would play host to annual school pageants, elaborate historical and military spectacles, musical concerts, firefighting demonstrations, local and regional sports contests, Fourth of July fireworks, and appearances by public figures known the world over. Teddy Roosevelt, John Philip Sousa, Babe Ruth, and Bob Hope, just to name a few. On these occasions, this grand structure was a sight to behold. To appreciate the Tacoma Stadium, one must see it on a July or August evening when the streets leading hither are a flutter with flags and the people are crowding in from every quarter. They come to the great abyss and drop over its edge. The space above one is circled wide and high. There seems no limit to the thousands it may hold. It is all a vast stipple of color, soft and infinitely varied. Slowly, the day fades out. Lighted vessels that are become great lanterns drift across the water below. The other thing that must have been fascinating uh, for that whole neighborhood uh, there with Wright Park and the churches and other things in that neighborhood must have been what it was like on the streets after an event got over with um, because there wasn't ever parking for 30,000 people's cars there. Uh, they either rode the streetcars or walked to the neighborhoods and so at the end of an event you'd have you know, 15, 20, 25,000 people walking from a single venue, and there's really only one direction to flood out of there and uh, into the rest of the city. And uh, you hear the stories about the streetcars just crammed with people and, uh, you know, the excitement on the streets and vendors and, you know, for, a, for that important of a part of the downtown to suddenly be infused with that much civic activity must have really been spectacular. The challenges that a venue of this size presented were many. For one thing, just hearing a speaker's address to the assembled audience was difficult, even with the best technology of the day. For events held after dark, electrical lighting was provided by a series of lights hung from cables strung crisscross over the field. And while the illumination was adequate, the lights would often swing wildly in a good wind. In the enthusiasm that surrounded the first summer of the bold 1910 dedication, a Tacoma newspaper headline had confidently proclaimed that the stadium floor will always be dry as a bone. They were to be words that may have haunted the writer in the decades that followed. There were to be times, most notably in 1932 and 1981, when the bowl was anything but dry, as broken storm sewer lines washed out much of the facility. Following the 1949 earthquake, Stadium Bowl endured years of intermittent closures as Tacoma and the school district struggled with repair, maintenance, and use issues. Happily, for the past 20 years, Stadium Bowl has enjoyed a period of structural stability, and it continues to serve Tacoma and the castle as an important outdoor gathering place. In 1910, Tacoma was justifiably proud of its impressive new high school campus, featuring the spacious castle and the spectacularly situated bowl. 
the first of many generations of students had settled into its classrooms and onto its playing fields and stages. For decades, the passage of their high school years were recorded faithfully in the pages of The Tahoma, a monthly school magazine featuring stories, poetry, illustrations, and the photographic portraits of the senior class. However, after just a few years, the student population of the castle grew to the point that space was again at a premium, necessitating construction of Lincoln Park High School in 1913 to help serve the growing city's south end. To distinguish between the city's two secondary institutions, Tacoma High School became known from this point on as Stadium High School, and a classic crosstown high school rivalry with Lincoln was born, which would remain undiluted for nearly 50 years until the opening of Wilson High School in 1958. Even with the addition of Lincoln High School, space at Stadium was tight, and alterations to the castle were initiated to increase space and facilities. The auditorium was enlarged in 1912. In 1917, the boys' and girls' gymnasium was relocated beneath the courtyard, and a boys' and girls' swimming pool was added. Interestingly, local newspapers testified that the girls have not been forgotten in this branch of work, noting the existence of gym classes for 173 girls and the existence of a girls' basketball team as early as 1907. In those days, girls' sports were intramural, not varsity. I remember, of course, athletics, because that's where I was a good share of my time as a student. Uh, I enjoyed the gymnasium, and I enjoyed what went on there. As a, as a result, uh, I majored in that kind of thing, physical education when I went on to college and uh, became a teacher. Over the decade, the new underground gymnasium would fondly be remembered as the pit or the dungeon. Renovation in the late 1950s kept the gym functional for another 40 plus years until 2004 when the castle campus closed in preparation for the centennial restoration work. World War I cast a long shadow across Stadium High School student life. As the castle approached the end of its second decade, the school faced the loss of 11 young men formerly from the student body. This sobering encounter with the hometown toll of war was the foundation of one of Stadium High School's long-standing solemn traditions, the laying of wreaths in the courtyard near the marker commemorating the World War I war dead. The installation of the theater organ in the auditorium in 1919 was also in dedication to the stadium alumni lost in the Great War. Today, the ceremony also remembers the other untimely losses to the student body in the many decades since. In 1922, the weekly school newspaper, The Stadium World, was established with a staff composed from students in advanced classes in English and news writing. The world prided itself on adhering to professional journalistic standards and boasted a circulation of 1,625. Students paid a rate of 50 cents per semester or $1 per year to subscribe. With the arrival of the world, the Tahoma changed from a monthly magazine format to the more familiar annual yearbook it is today. 1922 was also significant for it witnessed the first annual Thanksgiving Day football game between Lincoln and Stadium. The Turkey Day game between the crosstown rivals was a popular event among Tacomans as they watched the two adversaries exchange victories and winning streaks over the next 30 years. The Great Depression years of the 1930s saw very little in the way of major alterations to the castle. Hard times tightened purses and tested souls everywhere. But one lighthearted memory from a stadium student of this period recalls the steel fire escapes installed in the east turrets and demonstrates the escape even school could offer a young mind. Beside the outside fire escape, the interior of one of the round towers was made into a fire escape by building in a metal chute. The chute reached from the third floor balcony of the auditorium study hall to the basement. It was used mainly by students in study hall. It was the dream of every boy to be in study hall when a fire drill rang and be able to take that three-story ride to the basement. 
It could be the high point of one's day and was an exhilarating ride indeed. Another welcome diversion from the difficult economic climate was the Stadium Tigers baseball team's claim to the 1936 state championship after an undefeated season. And in spite of the depression, the student population of Stadium High School continued to grow through the 1930s, culminating with 667 graduating seniors in the class of 1938, the largest in the school's history. World War II indeed dominated the first half of the decade of the 1940s at Stadium High School. In what the local newspaper referred to as the first war class since June 1918. Many members of the class of 1942 were not present for their June commencement because they were already working in war-related industries. By the commencement exercises of June 1945, the parents of 50 boys who were serving in the armed forces received the diplomas on behalf of their sons away at war. All told, Stadium High School lost 57 students and alumni to the century's second global conflict. With the war's welcome end, the Stadium Tigers were pleased to return to a more civilian focus on high school life by claiming the City League and the State Football Championship titles in front of 16,000 people at Stadium Bowl on Thanksgiving Day 1946. That same year, a major structural change to the castle itself involved removing and replacing the four main wood stairwells with fireproof stair towers placed onto the north side of the school. With the approach of its half-century mark as a high school in the mid-1950s, Stadium was showing distinct signs of its age. Additionally, many aspects of student life, educational curricula, and recreational requirements had evolved since 1906 and taxed Stadium High School's ability to keep pace with modern demands and Tacoma's growing population. This became particularly apparent in the light of the planning for two new high schools, Woodrow Wilson, which would serve Tacoma's west side, and Mount Tahoma, which would serve the far southern end of the city. Indeed, the addition of Henry Foss High School in 1973 raised the bar even higher. To match the modern amenities of these high school newcomers, extensive work began at Stadium in the late 1950s and has continued nearly unabated to the present day. Among the major alterations were the remodeling, re-roofing, and gymnasium improvements of 1957 to 1960, the classroom, lunchroom, and counseling facility additions of 1965 to 69, and the construction of the Science and Art Annex in 1975. Most people don't realize that the copper finials on the roof are not the original material or the original copper finials. Originally, they were the pressed tin painted black because they wanted them to look like wrought iron. And the 1950s remodel, when they redid the roof the last time, they actually put copper work all the way around the building, the gutters, the finials. That's when copper was added to the building, not in 1906. The 1980s witnessed further remodeling of classroom, administrative, and auditorium space, construction of a new swimming pool building, which required the closure of North E Street, and further renovations to the courtyard and gymnasium dominated the end of the decade. While not all of the alterations of the past 50 years were entirely compatible with the castle's historic structure, the genuine intention was the improvement of the students' high school educational experience. <music> Student life and the educational experience at Stadium High has altered nearly as radically as the building itself has changed over the past 50 years. Civil rights, the culture of protest, and other hallmarks of 1960s and 70s change were very much in evidence at Stadium as they were across the rest of the U.S. Diverse offerings such as boys' culinary skills food classes and drug abuse awareness, educational topics never imagined in the school's early years, became part of the regular curriculum. In an era of racial concerns, students and school officials joined to address such issues with additional extracurricular opportunities, such as the creation in 1970 of Wenzi Wanafunzi, a club for Afro-American students 
a term used in that day. Um, there was an organization um, called Wayosi Wanafunzi, and um, it was just an organization for you know the minority students uh, to get together and. Uh, you know, have discussions. And it was needed, it was important, there was a lot of participation and um, I think it just brought everybody closer together. And, um, but at the same time, you know, we all, you know, went to school together, you know, blacks and whites and whatnot, and there weren't any issues there at all. Perhaps the most significant change in student life followed the passage of the 1972 federal legislation known as Title IX requiring gender equity in education. Nowhere was this more immediately obvious than in the profile of girls' athletics. A peek inside the pages of a yearbook from the mid to late 1960s show girls' intramurals playing basketball in street clothes and shoes and refer to the purpose of Stadiana, the school's long-established girls' athletic association, as being to provide the weaker sex with athletic recreation. A mere five years later, the 1974 Tahoma records the debut of girls' varsity teams in sports such as volleyball, swimming, track, gymnastics, tennis, and basketball. That same year, the girls' varsity basketball team took third in the city league. Regardless of the decade, academic emphasis, the amenities of the classroom and the playing field, or the ever-evolving concerns of the student, Stadium High School has had a unique hold on the memories of many who have walked its hallways. Maybe it was just me uh, in general, but I, I just think that all the, the people that, uh, that went to the school, they were all just really special people, you know. Even the last, um, last our 35th reunion, which was held in Gig Harbor, um, quite a few people turned out for that. and. Uh, it was like, you know, time hadn't really passed, that much time hadn't passed by. You know, the personalities were still basically the same. Obviously, we all changed, you know, physically. But, uh, I don't know, it was just that, that gleam in everybody's eye, you know, because it was just a special time for all of us. I think uh, perhaps my favorite member <laughs> of Stadium would have to do with my teaching. And uh, it would be uh, the f part of the fact that I was able to take care of these kids, I called them then, and I call them still, although they're adults, goodness knows. Um, and, and teaching them that uh, they could accomplish things that they uh, thought they never could, and, and hoping that that would carry on, emphasizing to them the fact that they could do other things as well. I happened to be there uh, the year that the Stadium Tiger basketball team won its first and only state championship, and uh, it was a remarkable year, and there were some aspects to that season that were, I think, rather unusual. It was the year that the school district decided to close down the gymnasium, which was less than regulation size, to build a new gym. And so the team that championship year had, did not have a home court. They played their, their games, their home games at the College of Puget Sound Fieldhouse, which turned out to be to their advantage because they played those games on a college size or college regulation size court, which served to their advantage when they played in that championship round at Heck Edmondson Pavilion. Of course, I was there cheering the Tigers on to victory. Uh, the other aspect uh, to that season was that there were four very talented black ball players on that team, Herman Washington, uh, Jim Johnson, and Luther and Charlie Williams. And this now back five years prior to the passage of the Civil Rights Act, um, it was kind of an unwritten rule that you wouldn't put on the court more than two black ball players at the same time. You know, it's hard to believe, but that was a tenor of the times. And the coach, uh, Jack Heinrich, put all four players on the court at the same time, more often than not. I think that the work that the teachers did there uh, helped to influence me in my life and uh, perhaps helped me be a better person, you know. And um, I surely enjoyed everything I did there. I happy-go-lucky, <laughs> still am. <laughs> It was a, a remarkable experience for me. I, I look back on it fondly. I think it's probably 
some of the best memories of my life. That uh, it was a time that personally I felt like I can do pretty much anything I wanted to, and, and I had a lot of support. I had a lot of uh, nurturing, both from my family and from classmates and teachers and things. And it was just that feeling of of in being able to accomplish anything if you really put your mind and heart into it. Over the past century, Stadium High School, Tacoma's Brown Castle, has graduated almost 40,000 students. Among them, such distinguished local alums as Henry Foss, class of 1910 and a half of Tacoma's celebrated Foss dynasty, who would become the namesake of another Tacoma High School in 1973. Noted Puget Sound historian Murray Morgan, class of 1933. Herman Bricks, class of 1924, who went on to fame as one of Hollywood's first Tarzans, as did Donna Mae Jaden, class of 1941, known to fans of stage, screen, and television as Janice Page. Albert Rosalini, class of 1927, and Dixie Lee Ray, class of 1933, served as governors of Washington State. The school has produced rock stars such as Buck Ormsby of the Whalers and internationally renowned glass artist Dale Chihuly was a stadium tiger until his senior year when he and other senior classmates moved to the newly opened Woodrow Wilson High School in the fall of 1958 to become members of that school's first graduating class of 1959. Famous or known only to family and friends, Every Stadium High School graduate carries their own individual memories of the years spent at the castle. I remember the steps uh, <laughs> going down. So I always got my exercise when we had games down there. And then of course we had the, the bonfires and things like that, the pep rallies and um, down in the bowl. And it was just, uh, it was just uh, picturesque, it was beautiful. The most fun of all was going down that ramp to the gym, though, because if you did it just right, you could hit off the wall as you went down, you know, and it was just glorious. A football game in the bowl was very cold because you're sitting on a huge heat sink. I mean, it's all stone. So uh, if you didn't have a blanket or something like that to kind of keep, you know, what warm, it was, it was, it was pretty cold. Well, we had a substitute teacher once, and. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> the class started, you know, bouncing their knees, you know, and uh, and and the floor started shaking, and then you know, so that there's an earthquake, there's an earthquake, and the substitute teacher, you know, that who was rather uh, aged, <laughs> got very worried that there was an earthquake. I mean, it truly is an icon. I think it kind of represents Tacoma in a lot of ways. It's uh, when I meet people that are. Uh, don't know much about the Northwest, but have heard about Tacoma and Seattle. They, it's surprising how many know about Stadium High School. So it, uh, it kind of goes beyond just the city itself. High on the Bluff is the most beautiful little spot in all Tacoma. It is too indescribably lovely. You may travel the world over and seek for a more beautiful scene. Rumor speaks of it as the grounds of the new hotel. Let us hope the grounds will be open to the public. Little did the wistful reporter of 1890 dream, waxing poetic in the writing style of the day, just how open to the public the new hotel and the grounds would one day be. And how much pride the city of Tacoma would take in its castle for the education of a community, Stadium High School. On this day of celebration, Tacoma once again turned its attention toward the castle on the hill and let the world know what this building and everything it stands for means to the city. Stadium graduate or not, they were there. 100 years, 40,000 graduates, and truly countless memories. Happy birthday, Stadium High School. Happy birthday to all of us.